Good evening and welcome to each of you. I thought it only fitting tonight, since we're going to be talking about the United States in Bible prophecy, that we take a journey to somewhere in the United States. Won't that be fair enough? Will you fasten your seatbelts then while the lights go down? We're going to leave, ladies and gentlemen, from the state of Washington, from northwest Washington. And we're going to make our way across the border to our friendly neighbors up in British Columbia, Canada, and that is the city of Vancouver. I think, by the way, that it's one of the most lovely cities in all the world. And I've been a lot of places and seen a lot of faces. Sound like a country song, doesn't it? I think it is. Well, <laughs> in any event, I just think that it's a beautiful, beautiful city, the city of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And it happens to be the birthplace of my daughter-in-law, Brenda. So that makes it special to me as well. We're going to get around the Fraser River Center downtown and, and see some of the sights. And, and then we'll move across over towards Stanley Park, Prospect Point. And, and if you've never been there, ladies and gentlemen, you're in for such a treat in the summertime particularly. It's just remarkably beautiful. There is just a little touch of it. Here the mountains rise up out of the blue waters of the inlets of the Fraser River, the various branches, and they're snow-capped in the background. It's just really one of my favorite cities in all of the world. But we're going to go beyond, you and I. We're going to fly from Vancouver up over the Chugach Mountains and down into Anchorage, Alaska, and then we'll move around up toward Denali Park, and um, we'll see what it looks like up there. I have spent a good amount of time in Alaska working like I'm doing here. I've held meetings in Anchorage and in Palmer and in Fairbanks and other places, and it's been my happy privilege to do a lot of driving. In fact, I think I've driven most all of the roads that are available to drive in Alaska, with perhaps the exception of the ice road up to the north of Prudhoe Bay. I haven't done that one. Maybe someday. But in any event, I've discovered that the folks who go to Alaska are unique. I mean, the folks that go to there to stay, not just the tourists who go for a day or two or a week or maybe go up to hunt, but the folks who go there to stay are rugged individualists. I think that's the best way to describe them. And if they stay more than just a year or two or three, they learn to do a variety of things because you just can't call on someone to come out and fix a leaky pipe or to, to do the carpenter work or to patch the roof or to bandage up someone's wound or some such thing, they become independent and uh, they love it up there because of its freedom. And I'm going to be talking to you, ladies and gentlemen, during the lecture in just a little bit about the tragic loss of freedoms all across the United States, and that includes Alaska as well. Here we see a meadow filled with their fireweeds and the Chugach Mountains in the summertime back behind. The first time I went to Alaska, I took my son Troy with me. I believe Troy was about 18 or 19 years of age at the time. And I promised him that we would see a grizzly bear. He'd never seen a grizzly bear before. I said, son, we'll stay until we see a grizzly bear. And so we drove all around. We drove way up around Fairbanks, and we did the circle back down to Valdez, and, and we drove down toward the Kenai, and we never did see a grizzly bear. And our money was gone. I said, son, I, I hate to break. Well, I won't break my promise. I took him to the zoo. <laughs> Over there on Mallee Road, I took him to the zoo, and we saw a couple of grizzly bear, and then we had to come home. But since then, I've on several occasions had the privilege to see the grizzly bears, young and old and, and big and small. And the largest ones are out on the Kodak, Kodiak Island, I should have better said, out on Kodiak. They say the largest four-footed carnivore in all the world is the big brown or grizz bear out on Kodiak Island. For a long while, I thought it was the polar bear, but no, they say that grizz out, that's out on the Kodiak is bigger uh, in average and in pounds than is the Kodiak bear. 
Well, you're apt to see moose and caribou and just about anything that is imaginable. And, and you'll also even see in the back country dog sleds. Well, if you're there at the time of the Iditarod, you'll see them in Main Street down in the city of Anchorage. In fact, that's where they leave from for that 1,100-mile race out to, Rome, or to Nome, Alaska, rather. And, and you know, of course, what it commemorates. There was a terrible illness out in Nome amongst the gold miners who were finding gold there in the sands where the Yukon dumps into the, North sea, the northern seas up there. And there's terrible outbreak of influenza and they needed to get medicine up there. And so a dog sled made the first run and they go through the little village of Iditarod. And so the name and the dog sled race the Iditarod. A few years ago, and this, by the way, really made Peggy feel good. A few years ago, amongst the mushers and the dogs, there was a poodle. So help me. She said, see there? <laughs> well, the beautiful, beautiful mountains, including the highest of all the mountains on the North American continent, and that is, of course, Denali. That's the native name. It means the tall one or the big one. For many, many years, of course, it was referred to generally as Mount McKinley and sometimes still is. No matter what you call it, it's 20,320 feet high. That is quite a climb. And there are pilots up there, bush pilots, that will fly you in and land you right on a glacier on the side of that mountain if you should so choose. I did not so choose. <laughs> but the mountains are majestic. They're awesome. And, and it's just, it's breathtaking country. And it is so huge, you know. They say they got the last laugh on Texas because the Texans for so long bragged about how large their state was. And they say, we can put a lot of Texas here in Alaska. Well, this is a kind of a typical little um, out of town shelter or little home. And over here on the side, you see the little building where they keep their meat, and that's for the protection for largely from the grizz bear. They put their things up in there, and they'll take the ladder down. If they left the ladder, of course, the old bear would get in there. <laughs> He'd find a way. I thought I used to have a lot of snow where I lived in Idaho, but look at this. Many of the folks have to dig a tunnel to get out, out into their, uh, into their driveway or out to town. In the fall of the year, there's so many wonderful, wonderful colors. And there is so much freedom, but there's a loss of freedom here as so many other places in the United States of America. There recently was a book written that was turned into an Oscar-winning movie, or Oscar-nominated, I believe at least, I'm correct in saying, and it was called Into the Wild. Do you remember that story about this young man that who came from the lower U.S. And, and wanted to kind of get away. And, and he crossed this river and found an old abandoned school bus and, and moved into it. And then things froze up and he ran out of food and all. And, and he died in there, but he, he wrote messages to his family on the wall in there. And if you remember the end of the story, had he just gone down the river, three quarters of a mile, there was a bridge. He could have easily gotten out, but he didn't know that, of course. Say, so there's a friendly-looking guy right there. I want to tell you about that picture. I had friends who'd flown in from Alabama, and they'd never seen Alaska, and they'd certainly never seen a grizzly bear, not even in the zoo. And so I took them. I was holding meetings in Fairbanks, and Peggy and I took them back into Denali Park. And we got to, on the bus that so would take us to the end of the road. It's a whole day's trip. Quite a journey. And you see all kinds of the, the wildlife of Alaska. And we had seen a grizzly bear, but he was, I suppose, an eighth of a mile away, quite a distance, and he was kind of loping along. And, and they said, well, I wish we could see one up close. Wish we could see one up close. As we came back, we rounded the curve, and the bus driver said, look, look. And at a cut bank, with the road cut through a hill, lying up above and on the cut, there was this huge old male grizzly. And so our guide, who was the bus driver, said, be very, very quiet. Be very quiet. I'll drive right up next to him. And everyone had their windows down. 
And there was a group of tourists from way out in the Far East. That I remember so very well. And they were all going, oh, and they were saying things that I couldn't understand, but excited. I could tell that, you know. And they all had their expensive cameras up like this. And the bus driver went right up till, I believe we could have reached out and touched this old boy. And I don't know if someone spoke too loudly or what, but suddenly he got up like that. <laughs> yeah. And, and those folks with their expensive cameras did just like you did. They jumped and sat down, and I'm laughing about it still. But he didn't threaten us really at all. He just, I suppose, thought someone might have a lunch to share with him. Well, someone told me that even here a few evenings ago, they saw the northern lights. Did any of you here recently? So, yeah, two or three of you are saying you did. Well, I had seen them down here in the lower 48 on occasion, but say the displacement, the, the display of Aurora Borealis up in Alaska is something else in the world. I was in Palmer on this occasion, hoping to see a real display of the northern lights. But one of the natives said, Lately, they've been coming on after midnight, and you know, that's when they've been really displaying clearly. I said, if you see it again, call me. Call me. And so I got a phone call from this man, and he said, they're really out tonight. It may have been 1.30, 2 o'clock in the morning, but he said, to really see them properly, you need to get in your car and go north, get out of the city lights, and go up to the hill, up out of town, out of the city lights, and then you'll have a good view. And so Peggy and I got up and got dressed and got awake, and we got in the car, and we went up to see the northern lights. They're something magical. Really, they are. It's a wonderful, wonderful place, Alaska, and it's yours, isn't it? I want to thank you for traveling with me. And now to our subject, the United States in Bible prophecy. If we were to give it a subtitle, it might well go something like this, The Coming Dictatorship in America. Having said that, I must now say this, and say it clearly enough that all can understand, Lyle is a loyal American. I have been to about 60 other countries of the world, perhaps more than that now, yes. I've been everywhere, as the song goes, but I want to tell you there is no place that I have ever found that comes anywhere near to these United States of America. We have our problems. We're not perfect. We have a long ways yet to go in certain areas of fairness and equality, but we've made great progress, and we continue to do that by God's grace. And I've discovered that the folks who throw rocks at us all nearly want to come and live here. There's no place that I know of like the United States of America. So be assured I'm a loyal American. While I'm a loyal American, I'm at the same time a concerned American. I'm concerned about a number of things, but mostly our gradual loss of freedom. It was Benjamin Franklin who said, those who give up essential liberties to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. Daniel Webster said, God grants liberty only to those who love it and are always ready to guard it and defend it. And I want to say to you, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, that our Lord Jesus taught that liberty is the heart of the gospel of himself. It is at the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Patrick Henry, you remember, said, give me liberty or give me death. To my heart's sorrow, it has come to my attention that America is like a wheel or a tire on a wheel upon my automobile that's got a lump in it. We're a little out of balance. And it seems that we're getting more out of balance nearly every week or every month for sure. The abuse of liberty, some long ago said, causes the loss of liberty, and we have seen that become a reality before our very eyes. We see folks break the law and abuse their liberties and do this and this and this, and pretty soon there's a law that won't allow you to do those kinds of things. On the world news tonight, there were two items that I want to bring to your attention. Number one, there was the revelation 
that three of our foremost politicians had their passport information looked into illegally. And then they went on to talk about how easy it is to look into anyone's passport information if someone chooses to disobey the rules and the laws. And then also in the world news tonight, there came the report of what is now known as the real ID identity card or driver's license. And I want to tell you something that happened to me a few days ago. I had a birthday. Well, that's not a big surprise. Most old guys do from time to time, every two or three years. <laughs> and my driver's license expired, and so I went in to renew my license. And I was not surprised when they said, we need to take your picture again. I know that I'm much better looking than I was 10 or 12 years ago when I got the last one. But when I got the last one, they took my picture, and then in about 15 minutes, they handed me my driver's license encased in a plastic container and ready to put in my wallet. There was my permanent driver's license, but not this time. The lady in charge said, your driver, we've taken your picture, but your license will be coming from Salem in just a few weeks. It'll probably be there in about six weeks. And I said, really, what's happened? Well, she said, you're soon going to find out. Well, I found out today, ladies and gentlemen, by the end of May, every American is going to have what is now called the real ID card. And this has come about, as, of course, as a result of the threat of terrorism and, and folks doing some naughty things that, um, that might be prevented, or at least we hope to prevent, by having this ID card. Now, I want to read you something. This was back the time of Ronald Reagan. As officials seek ways to account for possible troublemakers, we are already hearing proposals for a national identity card. The idea was floated recently during the Reagan administration, but it was rejected as too invasive of privacy. And what had happened was the Congress had voted against the thing because they said it takes away too many of our liberties. It, it gives too, too many folks too much access to some private information. And then came the dropping of the buildings of 9-11, and the world changed. And we have lost more liberties, ladies and gentlemen, since the 9-11 tragedy than in the prior 200 years. And this is one example. Now the National Identity Card is here for all Americans. And there, by the way, in the World News Tonight, a couple of states that are holding out, they're saying, our people don't like this idea, and the states have their rights not to go along if they choose. And the federal government has said, all right, if you want to go down that path, then we'll cut off all of your federal funds for highways and bridges and all of the rest. <sighs> interesting. Most interesting. I want you, ladies and gentlemen, please to open your Bibles, if you will, to Revelation chapter 13. This, of course, you recall, is our homework assignment. And I'm going to begin to read at the 11th verse, for I asked you, if you remember, to pay particular attention to the last half of Revelation 13. I'm going to take up the reading, if you please, at verse 11. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 and following. I looked and I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. And he exercised all of the power of the first beast that had been before him. And he caused the earth and those that dwell therein to worship that first beast, whose deadly wound was now healed. He does great wonders, miracles, say some translations. He does great wonders so that he makes fire to come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. He deceives those that dwell upon the earth by the means of the miracles which he has the power to do in the sight of the beast. And he says to those that live upon the earth that they ought to make an image to the beast that received the deadly wound and yet did live. He had power to give life to this image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship this image that they should be killed. And then he caused all small and great, rich and poor, free and bond to receive a mark either in their right hand or in their forehead, and no man could buy or sell unless he have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And the final verse, the 18th, says, Here is wisdom. Let him that understands count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and that number is 666. Here we have a, a beast, the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. And, and yet in many ways it's different from the other. This one comes up out of the earth. And additionally it has two horns, and these horns are lamb-like. 
Now, this second beast of Revelation 13 has a close collabor collaboration with, in fact, I think fair to say a conspiracy with, the first beast of Revelation 13, the one that received the deadly wound that was healed and would be healed before Jesus would come back. And this second power of Revelation 13, the second beast, if you please, forces those who are finally upon the earth to worship the first beast whose deadly wound has been healed. Now, we want once again to briefly cover the symbolism of a beast as it's used in Bible prophecy. God never called a power a beast to be naughty, nasty, or disrespectful, but he did it only for the purposes of identification in the same way that we today, if we're talking about Russia, refer to the bear, and if we're talking about uh, Great Britain, we refer to the lion, and here the buffalo or the American bald eagle. And so we have a symbolism here in the last half of Revelation 13 of a power, a nation. It's political in its power. We can certainly see that. Two horns, lamb-like, the great power at the end of time compels folks to worship that first beast that received the deadly wound, but whose wound would be healed just before Jesus comes back. Now, please, please follow carefully this next idea because it's vital to the rest of our information sharing. Before we can appreciate and understand the second beast of Revelation 13, beginning at the 11th verse, we must have a basic understanding of the first beast because of this collaboration, this conspiracy, this collusion between the two. Revelation chapter 13 and the first verses. Here in vision, John describes this first beast and this one comes up out of the sea, and it has uh, seven heads and ten horns, and upon its horns it has crowns, and it has the names of blasphemy. It was like a leopard, it had the feet of a bear, and it had the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and seed and great authority. And I, then I saw a head wounded, as it were, to death, but that wound was healed, and the whole world then wor followed after the beast. And they worshipped also the dragon who'd given him the power. And they worshipped the beast, saying unto him, Who is like unto him, who is able to make war against him? And there was given him a mouth that spoke great things. Power is given to him to continue for 40 and two months or 1260 years, as you remember we have studied on many prior occasions. He opened his mouth and blasphemed against God and blasphemed God's name and his tabernacle or his, his um, sanctuary service and all that went with it and all those that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war against the saints and overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and nations and tongues." This power claims to be God on earth, if you please, and it persecutes the saints, and it blasphemes. And the title of the Pope in the Latin, Vicarious Philae Dei, means the vicar of the Son of God, or one who sits in the place of the Son of God. Now, for those of you who've been coming quite regularly, this will only just be a brief review, but we've said on several prior occasions and have read from many historians this fact, every single reformer, was unanimous in their belief that the beast power of Revelation 13, the little horn power of Daniel 7, and the Antichrist spoken of by Jesus and Paul was none other than the Church of Rome. It was this idea that caused Martin Luther to nail 95 theses to the church door and begin to preach with great power. All of the reformers were unanimous in this matter. Now, I want to talk to you about how the reformers struck the first blow against this power. They began to preach with, with great vigor. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, John Huss, Latimer, Ridley, Cranmer, and a host of others, that the Church of Rome was the beast power, it was the little horn power of Daniel 7 and 25, and it was the Antichrist system. And they were persuasive, and they had Bible prophecy to back them up. The woman that sits upon the seven hills, the woman that is dressed in purple and scarlet color, and had we the opportunity here, which we didn't on this occasion, I might have put on the screen about a dozen pictures of the funeral service of Pope John Paul II. And there were the bishops, and there were the cardinals, and the bishops were all in purple color, and the cardinals were all in scarlet color. And it reminded me of reading out of Revelation chapters 13 and 14. A woman or a church sits on seven hills, the seven hills of the 
the city of Rome. It's still today known as the city of seven hills and a woman dressed in purple and scarlet color. And so with this for background, these reformers, Luther, Calvin, Knox, these Catholic priests began to preach to the church of Rome because of its great movement away from God's word and God's truth and God's gospel was the beast power of uh, Revelation and the little horn power of Daniel and Catholic peoples began to leave the Catholic church like rats disembarking a sinking ship. This wound that was inflicted continued to grow and fester and, uh, and begin to bleed and hemorrhage. And then there came the French Revolution. And before the little dictator of all of the world went over to take the Pope captive, there was a decree against every leader. In France, I'm speaking now, there was a decree against every leader of the Roman Catholic Church, and 70% of the Roman Catholic priests were martyred. And by the way, I'm not suggesting this was right. It was terrible, and it was wrong. And almost 100% of all of the nuns in the nation of France were killed, and the nation of France has never recovered. The Church of Rome, which was prominent and prevalent up until this time, has never, never regained its power. And the nation of France, uh, by and large, is, um, uh, I suppose, to be kind, atheistic. Now, Napoleon then sends Berthier over to Rome inside the Vatican, takes the Pope captive and says there will never be another Pope. And it looked for sure that the Catholic Church was going to die. There for three years was no Pope in Rome. There was one over in Avignon who claimed to be uh, the Pope, but, but there was no Pope in Rome. But the Bible prophecy said the deadly wound would be healed. The United States of America, if you know any of our history, was founded in order to escape the tyranny of Rome, the influence of the Church of Rome as it had spread across the face of Europe. Now, we're going to transition, and I'm going to give you, ladies and gentlemen, five reasons for believing that the second beast of Revelation 13, that one that's described in verses 11 and following, is the United States of America. I want you to notice verse 10, if you will, please, of Revelation 13. Revelation 13, reading verse 10. He that leads into captivity shall go himself into captivity. He that kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. Here is the patience of the saints. Now, this is talking about the power described in the first verses of Revelation 13, the power that we believe rightly as Protestants to be the church of Rome. He that has taken captives will himself go into captivity. Uh, let's review briefly then. 798, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, has the Pope taken captive. Now mark it down. If not in your Bibles, certainly in your minds and in your notes. 798. Now it says in the 11th verse, now I see another beast. And I want you to see the time connect here because it is vital in its import. At the time of the captivity, now John in vision sees another power rising up. What do we give as the birth date of the United States? What? 1776. This happened in 1798. In 1798, ladies and gentlemen, the United States of America was still in its infancy. We were still in our birth pangs as a nation. We had not yet arrived at the banks of the muddy Mississippi. And so the time of the arrival... Clue number one, as we search for this second beast of Revelation to believe that it's the United States, clue number one certainly fits the clue of the time of the arrival. I saw another beast, another nation rising up. Clue number two, the clue of location. When we look for the mark of the beast, and the mystery of Babylon, we found their clues of location. And as we look tonight for the United States in Bible prophecy, we shall again find a clue of location. So this is clue number two, the clue of location. All of the other beasts of Revelation, or of Daniel largely for that matter, the other nations symbolized by beasts came up out of the out of the water, out of the sea. This one does not. This one is different. This one comes up out of the earth. Now, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15, and I want you to mark it down. We don't have time to, well, let's do it. Let's take the time. 
It's really very important. Let's go over to chapter 17, and we'll read the 15th verse. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 15. Here it is. He said to me, The waters which you saw, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And all of the other beasts of Revelation and Daniel came up out of the sea. That means they came up where there had been another nation prior to them. Maybe they threw over the one, the government that was there ahead of them that had preceded them. And, uh, and this one then is very, very different. This one comes up out of the earth where there was not a prior nation. Someone once said to me, well, I have kind of an objection to that whole idea that the United States came up where there was never no. What about the Native American? Well, a couple of things very briefly. There are far, far more Native Americans here now than when Columbus came over here or when in 1776 we became a nation. And more than that, the Native Americans were really not organized into one nation, were they now? No, there was the Sioux tribe and there was the, this tribe and that tribe and the coastal tribes, but they were not organized together. And so this one is unique. It arises up out of the earth where there'd never been another power or nation here prior to it. Clue number three. Clue number three really asks a question, what kind of a power will this be? What kind of a, this new nation, what kind of a, an organization is it going to have? Well, I want you to notice once more the symbolism. It says about this new nation of Revelation 13, the last half, that it has two horns. Now, the first verses that we read from Revelation 13, Beast had seven heads and ten horns, and each of those horns had something on it. What was it? What did they have? Same thing back in Daniel. Each horn had a crown upon it, but this one is different. Has two horns, but it does not have a crown upon the head of state. In other words, this nation will not be ruled over by a king or a queen. There will be no crown upon the head of state. And then that brings us automatically to number four, clue number four. Not only will it not have a crown on the head of state, it will not have a crown on the head of the church. It will not be ruled over by the pope or any such thing. There will be a separation of church and state. And I believe, by the way, that it was that separation of church and state that made this country the great country that it was to become. And so clue number three there is no crown on the head of state. And number four, there is no crown upon the head of church, not ruled over by a king or a queen, not ruled over by a pope or any such thing as that. Number five. Number five, this new power says, let us make an image. Let us make a likeness. Let us make a repeat. We've said on so many occasions when we've studied the book of Revelation that it is written in symbols. Not in most places to be taken literally, but certainly here it's speaking of symbols. Some have written and suggested that down in the southwest deserts there is going to be erected a great monument one day, perhaps in just a few months or years, and that perhaps a special rail will be made there, or perhaps uh, there will be a special airport built, and the American peoples in groups will be flown there or taken there by bus or by train, and the trumpet blows and everyone has to bow down before this great statue, and, and then after they have bowed uh, and after the blowing of the trumpet, someone comes along and asks, where do you want your mark now? Do you want your uh, computer chip embedded in your forehead or in your hand? Where do you want your laser beam tattoo? Now, God is speaking here symbolically, but this power that we believe to be the United States is going to be a repeat. It's going to be a likeness of that power that was here before it. Now, before we move further, let's make quickly a review of the five reasons for believing that the United States of America is the second beast of Revelation chapter 13. Number one, the time of the arrival. When the Pope was taken captive in 1798, the United States was still in its birth pangs, number one. Number two, the location. This one comes up out of the earth, not out of the sea, not where there'd been nations or peoples, languages before it, but comes up out of the earth where, where it was new real estate, if you please. And then number three, it'll not be ruled over by a king. And number four, it'll not be ruled over by the church or the Pope. And number five, it will make an image. It will make... A repeat. Now, I want to talk about 
the future of the United States of America and our, our existence as a nation and as a people. Often, in the last few years particularly, folks have come to me and asked, Lyle, what do you think is going to happen? Does the Bible make any suggestion? The Chinese are flexing their muscles, and the North Koreans have the bomb, and, and maybe the Chinese are going to get together with the Russians, and, and they're going to knock us over and, and plow us under, and, and we're going to go down. Ladies and gentlemen, there is not the slightest hint in any prophecy, certainly not this one that I believe deals directly with the United States, not the slightest hint that this nation is ever going to be taken by an outside force. It is going to be the great superpower when Jesus comes back. Now, that may be another sign that he's going to have to hurry back. Huh? How about that? 25 years ago, I had to preach this passage by faith. Why? Because there were two great world superpowers. There were two, the United States and the Soviet Union. And we had hundreds and hundreds of missiles pointed at one another. And both had great armies. And many said it would be a standoff. It would be a total annihilation of the United States. But it was Mr. Gorbachev who at the time of the Gulf War, initiated by President George Herbert W. Bush, it was Gorbachev who said at the time we were dropping guided missiles down chimneys into exact locations. Mr. Gorbachev said, surely now the whole world can see that there is only one superpower. And that's the United States. Now, there comes a valid question at this juncture. Why, why would God ever mention a nation in Bible prophecy? Why? Well, I want to leave at least two ideas in your minds. Number one, he would mention a nation in Bible prophecy because of the worldwide influence of that nation. Not upon its own peoples only, but of the peoples of other nations and tribes. Would the United States count in that regard? Have we had an influence over the rest of the world? Look at the great world wars. Look at the finances that the peoples of the United States have sent here and there and all around the world to rebuild and to remake and redo. And look at the, how the American Bible Society has tried to spread the gospel to the whole world and influence folks in favor of Jesus and his truths. And so the United States certainly qualifies on this count, its worldwide influence. And number two then, its impact upon the people and the work of God. And again, the idea of sending Bibles, but not only that, the United States has sent more missionaries to the rest of the world than any one other single country in all of the history of Christianity. There has never been another quite like us. And so the United States qualifies in these two areas, it seems to me, its worldwide political influence and its impact upon the people of God and the work of God. Now, Let's talk about the power then of the United States of America in the last days. And I want us to go back for a little bit of review of that first beast we believe to be the power of the Church of Rome. And we're going to read at verse 7. Revelation 13, verse 7. After this power has opened its mouth to blaspheme God and, and to denigrate the tabernacle service, where, by the way, Jesus was offered once for all, you know, you read in the book of Hebrews, he shed his blood, he spilled his blood once for all, but the church of Rome says, no, we sacrifice him in every mass. And that's why it's called the sacrifice of the mass. And that's why at every mass celebration, when the chalice which holds the host, or those little bits of bread and, and water commingled together and baked, called the host in the Catholic Church. And as soon as those words were spoken, always priorly in the Latin, hoc est corpus meum, but now in the vernacular, the language of the people wherever they are found, this is my body. And in Roman Catholic theology, as soon as those words are spoken, those little bits of bread and water are turned into the very absolute real body of Jesus. And folks are made holy and made worthy by eating Christ. And that's a reference then to the desecration of God's tabernacle where, where the, the symbolism, the little lamb that would, uh, that would be sacrificed once for all. But the church says, no, we sacrifice Jesus in every single mass. Well, <clears throat> in 
It says then in verse 7, power was given to this institution we believe to be the church to make war against the saints, to overcome them. Power was given them over all kindreds and tongues and nations. The church of Rome ruled the world largely for 1260 years, and we have said that over and over and over again. Up until the time of King Henry VIII of Great Britain, and by the way, he didn't make his break with the church over a disagreement regarding theology particularly, but rather it was his desire, his, uh, his relentless desire to have a male heir. And the church said, no, we're not going to allow you to divorce that wife. All right, I'll kill her. Yeah, and when the next wife couldn't produce it, then he, he went a step further and a step further. And finally, he broke with the Roman Catholic Church, and the Anglican Church was born with the king or queen as the head of the church, not the pope, but two crowns. On the, the one on the head of state is the same as the one on the head of church. And so we see then this second beast power that we believe to be the United States, exercising all the power of the first beast there before it. We ought to read that from verse 12. He exercised all of the power of the first beast that was before him, and he caused the earth and those that dwell therein to worship that first beast whose deadly wound has been healed. Now please listen to this next idea very carefully because it is so vitally important. Every time, underline it. Without exception, every time God has mentioned a nation in Bible prophecy, whether it's here in Revelation or back in Daniel or elsewhere, that nation has ultimately rejected the truths of God and begun to persecute the people of God. That's what happened in Babylon. That's what happened in Persia. That's what happened in Egypt. And that's what happened in Rome. And the prophecy says that's what's going to happen here. The symbolism of this second beast of Revelation 13, whom we believe to be the United States, is that it is lamb-like. And we refer to ourselves often, don't we, as the Christian nation. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Christian nation. It looks lamb-like on the outside, but on the inside it has the voice and the command of the devil himself. It speaks with the voice of a dragon and the dragon power. Moreover then, it's clear that there is a conspiracy between the United States and the Church of Rome and her Protestant daughters in a united effort to control the world. So I'm going to begin now to share with you some evidence of the healing of the wound and of the mission of the United States to reunite with the forces of Rome to control the world and to bring an end of terrorism. And again, let me remind you that the world changed after 9-11. We live now in a completely and totally different world. I want to take your minds firstly now to a man by the name of General Tommy Franks. You remember Tommy Franks, who led our soldiers against King Hussein, uh, Saddam rather, Saddam Hussein in 2003? Not very long ago, months only. He was interviewed by the magazine called Cigar Aficionado. Now, I'm not promoting the magazine, but I do want to refer to the interview here. If you want to go and look it up on the web, this is from volume 12, number one. Volume 12, number one, Cigar Aficionado. Now listen carefully. Tommy Franks, in event of a major terrorist attack, we could lose the freedoms and the liberties of 200 years. The potential of war a war of mass destruction with massive casualty producing events either in the United States or in the Western world will cause the population of the United States to question our Constitution, to militarize our country, and undo and unravel the fabric of our Constitution. Several years ago, a young man who I knew more than personally, was attending a major military school. He graduated from college with the highest of honors, four point plus plus, and was gladly accepted to this major military school. I'm not going to give you the name of it, and of course not the name of the young man. He finished a year there at the top of his class. And then suddenly, without warning, he was home. What's going on? I asked. 
Should I quit? What? You had such a bright military future, you would have gone right to the top. You'd have hardly had room on a uniform for the ribbons and the medals. What? Yes, he said, I quit. And I'll tell you why. He said, all we students entering into the advanced courses were commanded to take an oath, swear an oath, that if necessary, we would turn our guns and our mortars upon United States citizens. And he said, I refuse to do it, and I had to quit. We think about freedoms here in the United States, and, uh, and well, if we don't like it, we'll vote against it. Look, back in the time of our then president, Mr. Nixon, there were given certain executive orders, and I want to read just two or three of them to you, passed by uh, the government. It says that uh, in any, t any time of national emergency, security, military, financial, or otherwise. In other words, if the banks are about to fail, or if there's a military threat, or if the buildings are blown up, our president can put these things into order without anyone's permission. He just makes up his mind. Number one, he seizes all communication media in the United States. Freedom of the press? No. Now, I was working in Oklahoma City when that thing was going on in Waco, Texas, and there were news folks from Oklahoma City that were down there, and they gave the report every night, and they said they'll not allow us with our cameras to get nearer than two miles. No freedom of the press. The seizure of all electrical power and fuels and minerals and other public services. The seizure of all food supplies and resources, public and private, farms and farm equipment. The seizure of all transportation, including personal trucks and vehicles of every kind. Seizure of all American peoples for workforces under federal supervision, including the splitting up of families uh, if the government finds it necessary. Seizure of all health and educational welfare, both public and private. Empowering the Postmaster General to register all men, women and children in the United States. And of course, that has now happened. For 150 years, ladies and gentlemen, we had not in either house of our government a Roman Catholic. Now, I don't know if that was a result of prejudice. I don't know if it, uh, I, I don't know. And that's really not my point tonight. I hope it was not as a result of prejudice. But it was not until the 1930s that the United States elected its first senator who was a Roman Catholic. It took another 15 years before there was a second Roman Catholic that was put into the halls of Congress. Today, ladies and gentlemen, there are 127, wait a minute, I'm incorrect here and I want to be correct. There are 157 Roman Catholics in both houses. In addition, there are five Orthodox, which are very similar, and this is an article, by the way, from a church source, not mine or yours probably. Amongst the Orthodox, and then it goes on to say, many Episcopalians who also have similar views for a total of about 175 of the legislators, 157 are Roman Catholic. And then we come to the Supreme Court. In the Supreme Court, we now have five of the nine justices that are Roman Catholic. And we have the Speaker of the House, and we go on and on and on and on. And things have changed. I'm going to read you quickly Rome's challenge. This is a quotation from the Church of Rome. When the time comes and men realize the social edifice must be rebuilt, the Catholic Church will make obligatory the observance of Sunday on behalf of the whole of society and for its own good, revoking the permit of free thinkers or Jews to celebrate Monday or Saturday or any other day on their own account. Here's one. Pope Benedict, that's the present Pope, ladies and gentlemen. Pope Benedict, by the way, he was the theological advisor of Pope John Paul II. And, and the dictums and the, and, and the enforcements that Pope John Paul II uh, made and, and put out ex cathedra, we understand now, were written, put together by the present Pope. So I want to read you this. Pope John Paul II issued a stern warning against Catholics that they should set aside Sunday for worship and not errands or other things involving just their free time. He used his weekly address from his window above St. Peter's to urge church members to make time to keep the Sabbath holy. And the Vatican is expected to issue an apostolic letter from the Pope further stressing the importance of keeping this commandment. 
Now listen to this. Cardinal O'Connor, New York City, has stated in a political address that Roman Catholics who are in public office risk excommunication if they do not vote according to the teachings of the Catholic Church. Now, a Protestant hears that and has no idea what it means. What does that mean? Excommunication. Well, that just means they're kicked out of their church. No, no, no. Catholics are taught, and I studied Roman Catholic theology, as I've told you, at Notre Dame University. Catholics are taught that salvation comes largely by eating the host. And excommunication means cut off from eating from the communion table. And when they're cut off from that, they're damned even beyond purgatory, not even allowed to go to the place of purging, but damned to the fires of hell. Now, you take a serious Catholic and tell him, if you don't vote along with the church in regard to abortion or Sunday observance, you're going to be cut off. And he's going to think very seriously. And he's going to act according to the way he's been brought up from a child. Now, let me read you something that happened during the time of President Clinton. Now, this isn't ancient history, is it? Huh? There was a lady by the name of Janet Reno who was our highest law maker in the United States. And this is from 60 Minutes program, if you want to look it up, from June 26 of 1999. Listen to this. A cultist... This is a quotation from Janet Reno. A cultist is one who has a strong belief in the Bible, in the second coming of Jesus Christ, who frequently attends Bible studies, who has a high level of financial giving to a Christian cause, someone who often homeschools their own children, who's accumulated survival foods and has a strong belief in the Second Amendment, and distrusts big government. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. That may mean more than one or two. Huh. U.S. News and World Report, M.G. Pat Roberts and the 700 Club, all right? Talking about the sleeping American vote, he said. Born-again Christians of whom there are 30 million Protestants and morally conservative Roman Catholics of whom there are many, many other millions, together with a few million Mormons and Orthodox Jews and others, have a potential to, to come to a number of nearly 60 million. And then he goes on to say, counting Catholics and Protestants, we have enough votes to run this country. And when the people say we've had enough, we're going to take it over. And this is one of the authors of that, uh, that joining together of Catholics and Protestants that we talked about on another evening. I was over in Salem, and I read that report not very long ago, and a man coming to my meeting who'd been sending Pat Robertson a lot of money wrote to him. He said he was shocked to hear this, and he said, I'm going to write to him, I'm going to complain. And he did. And um, Pat Robertson wrote him back, and I have the original right here in my hand. He says, thank you, sir. I'll not give the name. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you concerning my participation in the statement of evangelicals and Catholics together, the Christian mission for the third millennium. Obviously, there are very many differences within Christian faiths, between Jews and Christians and, and Protestants and Catholics. But it is my heartfelt belief that our common enemies are now so virulent that we must lay aside our certain differences and join hands in support upon these things upon which we do agree. My favorite writer outside the Bible 150 years ago said that Catholics and Protestants would reach across the gulf to join hands. That exact same phrase. Here's one for you. Urging the strict observance of Sunday, Pope Benedict, behind this letter, telling the Catholic leadership that they have to observe Sunday and have to vote to enforce others to do so. My friend, and, um, and more than a friend, went down to South America a while back to hold some meetings very like these, and there were several thousand folks who were baptized at the end of his meetings. And I want to read to you a little bit about what happened there. At the 35th, 31st National Conference of Bishops in Brazil, the bishop said, and I'm quoting, we will declare a holy war. The Catholic Church has a ponderous structure, and when we move, we'll smash everyone beneath us. And they were talking about what was happening with folks like my friend who were holding meetings, teaching folks that the Sabbath is Saturday and Jesus is coming back. Here's an apostolic letter, ladies and gentlemen. It's also from South America, and I want to read a verse or two, or a word or two from it to you because I feel the necessity of it. A, do a document at the suggestion of the Holy Father, 
and his successor. We will not tolerate the keeping of any other day or by any other religion except of Sunday. We will not tolerate any belief in the keeping of another day that is in accordance even with the Bible, except it goes by the holy tradition and liturgy. We will, cannot and will not tolerate Jews, Sabbatize, and Adventists, or any other sect that does not keep the Lord's Day Sunday. We will not tolerate those who seek to understand or accept precepts outlined uh, that are not outlined by the Holy Father, the Pope, in regards to the Lord's Resurrection Sunday, and on and on and on. It goes on to mention by name some folks that you may know well, hmm. well, when it all comes down, I'll do what's right. If I see these things begin to happen, I'll get on board and I'll do what's right. It's here, folks. It's too late. Choose you this day. Someone said to the old prophet Jeremiah, if you can't keep ahead of your enemies... When you're on horseback, what are you going to do when they come after you and you are on foot? What makes us think that suddenly we're going to have the spiritual strength to stand for God and keep His commandments when someone has a gun at the head of our children or our grandchildren? I beg you once more, do what's right now. For the prophecies are almost all fulfilled. We're going to see that further even tomorrow morning. For now, Thank you for your patience, and let me pray. Lord Jesus, tonight, we see the urgency of the hour. We see the times in which we live. We know we're in the very last days. And we see this prophecy, Revelation 13, the joining together of Catholics and Protestants and, and governments enforcing the wishes of the church. We want to stand true for you today and tomorrow and in the future and always. We want a part of your kingdom. By the way, dear hearts, tonight, if your heart feels like mine, if you feel a need for, for greater courage and greater strength now to do what God asks, if you want a, a closer relationship with Jesus, I wonder if you wouldn't like to join me in just raising your hand to Jesus tonight. He knows your hand. He knows your heart. Of course, every hand is up, every hand. God bless all of you. Lord, tonight, give us what we need. Grant to us more and better than we know how to ask for ourselves and answer our prayers because we always pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.